Uh, David Miscavige uh, used information uh, against people that were that was gained in a Scientology confessional. David Miscavige specialized in doing that. He loved doing that. He did it all the time. And to, as a precursor, could you describe what a what a confessional scenario is like in Scientology? Okay, a confessional in Scientology, you it's like an auditing session. You've got an auditor or a confessor, and you've got a, a preclear. Or, or a person who's being counseled. And it's just like an auditing session where you ask the guy a question about you know, his mind or his time track, and he goes back in his mind and finds an answer and gives it to you. Except in a confessional, it has to do with transgressions that you've committed. It's a specialized form of auditing. Okay? And you ask the guy, have you stolen anything? You know, Boom. Reads, reads on the meter. And then you look at the guy and you ask him to answer the question. You know, and you get the guy to confess, okay? And it works like auditing, too, because when you confess something, it's a very cathartic experience. You get this floating needle phenomenon on the, on the e-meter, which indicates that the guy's space is in a good place, you know, his personal spiritual mm -hmm. space. And you can see it in the guy. There's a lot of relief, color in the face, the whole thing. That's basically a confessional in, in, in Scientology. There's a little bit of an aberration or hitch connected with it because sometime in the 60s when the AMA and the BMA and the FDA and the CIA and the FBI and everybody and their brother, Alphabet Soup was after L. Ron Hubbard, uh, you know, he got a little bit worried about security within the organization and he started this thing which he called security checks. So it was using confessionals as a security tool to make sure that people around you could be trusted, you see? And that really kind of threw a, a, a bit of a wrench in the works because now it's no longer solely for the purpose of the benefit of the person being uh, receiving the confessional. It's for the, actually for the benefit of the organization to give it more comfort that it's not being infiltrated or you don't have people you know, that are untrustworthy around you. So. It's one of those dichotomies in Scientology, you know. And this uh, is also the confessional is a beautiful thing. The security check ain't necessarily such a beautiful thing, depending on the context. It's open for abuse because when the concept of security check came up, and si since it's more of a, a group consideration, it became permissible to report the results of the things that came up or were confessed to the authorities within the church so that they could then take whatever action was required, either with that individual from an ethics perspective or, you know, organization that they could use that information to evaluate situations or whatever. So it, th that's the confessional and the security check. Um, David Miscavige took full and complete advantage of the security check aspect and was obsessed with finding out any details he could about people. And, you know, from one perspective, it put me in a really strange position because one of the greatest joys I have is giving a confessional to somebody because they get a tremendous amount of gain out of it. But when you start seeing that, you know, the fruits of that, you know, you see this guy, this man or this woman, you know, walk out of there feeling 10 feet high and then you go down to a conference two hours later and Miscavige is there at the head of the table, you know, talking about this guy or this girl's sexual peccadilloes that came up in the security check. You know, it really, it really becomes sort of gut wrenching, and uh, you know, you get it, it, you're conflicted. You become conflicted. So he shared the private information that was shared in a security check. He shared that with other people. Right. How many other people, at it, like around a conference table? In a, in around a conference table with 40 people, all of management. They'd have these conferences all the time. You know, everybody have to get it attention and wait for Miscavige to show up. He'd show up, sit down at the end of the table. Everybody else would sit down, and then, you know, he'd give his spiel on whatever it was about. Many, many times, he'd just sit there and, and denigrate people for the things that they confessed to doing. Now, you said... Which, incidentally, and I say, you know, we... I always tell you, I always tell you there's... There's, you know, a big difference between L. Ron Hubbard and David Miscavige because he continually tries, continually tries to position himself as the second coming, okay? Um, and this is the perfect example of where, uh, you know, those things 
could, couldn't be further departures um, because he, he, he reveled in that. He reveled in, in bringing people down with that information when the whole purpose of it is to get the guy event and bring him up. Now you see you how it sabotages the whole process. You said it was okay to use that security check information, but was that done a, in a quiet sort of one-on-one -on -one scenario? Usually? That's how it was intended. Okay. And that happens all the time. That happens over at Flag day in and day out, even if you're a public. Mm -hmm. Like intended. these people on OT7, they come in every six months and they get a little security check. Mm -hmm. Not a big deal. But things will come up. You know, they'll have some peccadillos or they'll have some uh, ethics situation. Well, what will happen is they'll get routed to go see the ethics officer and it'll be one-on-one -on -one with the ethics officer and I'll go, hey, I see you've been shoplifting, or I see you, you know, you've been cheating your partner, or whatever, you know. How are we going to address this? You know, this needs to be addressed because if you continue this act, kind of activity and you don't make good for it, you're never going to get any gain out of any of this. But you're right, it's in a one-to-one, -one, let's get you to sort it out type of thing. It's not, they don't have a, uh, an assembly over at the, over at the ballroom at the Fort Harrison, you know, at graduation night and, and announce these guys' transgressions. But that's literally what happens up at Int. I mean, he's literally had base briefings where all 900 or 700 staff are, are down in that big dining hall down there, and he'll get up there and just start spewing about, about uh, people's confessions that they, that they disclosed, uh, you know, to, to, to denigrate them in front of everybody. In, the, in your mind, that's an abuse of the, that practice? Oh, yeah, absolutely.